we've been in our series now we've you know we 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 don't necessarily do it every week but we're in our series on honor and uh, we've talked about a number of things we talked about honoring God which all honor really starts with honoring the Lord if we don't honor the Lord you can't honor really anything else it all starts there and so there's a need to honor God and then we talked about ways you do that there's ways that we honor the Lord and then we talked about, of course, honoring your father and mother. That's one of the standout passages of Scripture. The Bible actually says when you honor your father and mother, your days will be long on the earth. So you can shorten or lengthen your days by how you honor certain people. Amen. And what you do and show related to that. And then we talked about betrayal and it being really the highest form of dishonor. It really is. Judas showed us that and other people in the scripture. Then we talked about honoring leaders. We'll go back and revisit that a little bit, not today, but there are different kinds of leaders in your life, and we'll go back and, and discuss that a little bit and revisit that a little bit at a later time. And then the last time we talked to you about honoring uh, the marriage relationship, and that's very, very, very important. Amen? And so today I'm going to talk to you about developing a culture of honor, developing a culture of honor, because our society and our culture is by and large a dishonorable culture. And so we, if we're not careful, it begins to affect the way we think, the way we do, and the way we act. Now, if you're a person who expresses a belief in God and a belief in his word and tries to live by that word, you're going to be going upstream. You're not going to be going with the flow. All you have to do to, well, I'll just say it plainly, all you have to do to go to hell is go along. That's all you have to do. You, you, just, get on the, you just get on the riverboat and it's going downstream. You don't, you, you know, you, you got to go upstream to serve God. And the scripture says that. Um, broad is the way that leads to destruction. But narrow is the way that leads to life. And so all you got to do is just get on the broad way and just go along. Let, you know, put the oars in the boat and float downstream. You ever get on one of these, you know, you go up here in the mountains, you go up here, especially on that towns inside you can go up there and get you an inner tube you ever done that go up there it's, it's chilly <laughs> get you an inner tube you get down in the in the in the creek river or whatever that thing is and all you got to do is just get in and let it take you downstream it's fun especially in a hot summer uh, afternoon, it's fun, you know. But all you got to do is let go. And you'll get down, somebody has to pick you up. But, you know, you can get down, down a ways. And that's the way the world is. All you got to do is go along. But to serve the Lord, it's a little different. You got to cut it just a wee bit cross grain. You got to go in a different way. And you have to make choices with life, what you're going to do, what's important to you. Um, it's easy to go along. Somebody said, well, you know, I, I didn't have any trouble until I became a Christian. Well, the devil didn't have any trouble with you until you did either. And he'll kind of leave you alone when you cause him no problems. But the more you draw into God... Uh, you might find there is some spiritual opposition. Now, God has given us the equipment to overcome him. And he's given us the tools to defeat him. But if you think the devil's just going to lay down because you got saved, you're kidding yourself. He's not happy with you. Of course, one thing about it, I'm not happy with him either, so what's the difference? <laughs> you know. But I just say those things not to glorify his work and what he does, but to say to you that sometimes people get this mistaken idea that serving the Lord is just, you know, it's just a flowery bed of ease. It's just a bed of roses. It just goes along. Everything's wonderful and fine. It's through much tribulation 
that we enter into the kingdom of God. That's what the scripture says. The devil will trouble you. He's the troublemaker. But if you go along with him, you're not going to like where he takes you. He will destroy your life. He will destroy your testimony. He'll destroy everything. about. He'll take your life early. He'll do, he'll do everything bad to you he can do to you and then tell you God did it. But when you start breaking out of that, uh, he, he won't necessarily like that. He won't be thrilled about that. You know? And so uh, we have to make choices with our life. Is this thing worth it? You think about heaven. If you can, best you can do with it, you can't scratch an inch deep in it for what the reality of it's, of it's going to be. But when you think about it and you think what awaits you, it's worth it. Well, you bet it's worth it. Amen. And so, uh, again, talking to you today about developing a culture of honor. Now, we see over here, and this is sort of what's been our text verse to get us into this line of teaching. But when Jesus went to his own hometown of Nazareth, we find in Mark chapter 6, the scripture says that he could there do no mighty works because of certain things that were going on in that environment. Now, this is Jesus' hometown. This is where he grew up. And uh, verse number uh, three, it says that, uh, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended in him. And so uh, Jesus in his own hometown, uh, there, there was an offense toward him for probably a variety of reasons. His success was challenging. Maybe they hadn't done quite as much with their life as he had. Maybe it brought some jealousy. Could be. And uh, he spoke. Scripture says he spoke as one who had authority. When you show some authority, there's people who don't necessarily like that. When you act like you know what you're talking about, it bothers people. They like people who apologize for everything they say. But Jesus didn't give any apologies. He just said it. Because he knew it. He was it. He didn't just know it. He was it. He was the word made flesh and dwelt among us. He knew it. Amen. And so uh, it tells us here, but Jesus said unto them, a prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and his own house. And he could there do no mighty work. So he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them. And they, he marveled at their unbelief. And so all these things are related to unbelief, but the scripture says that a prophet in this case, him, but he didn't just say it related only to him. He would say that about any prophet, that a prophet is not without honor, 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 except around those who are, you know, too, too, a little too close. They knew a little too much. They were too familiar, whatever. And so this concept of a lack of honor stopped the power of God, stopped their visitation from God, stopped them from receiving from God. They weren't healed. They weren't delivered. They weren't set free. Anything that God wanted to do, he couldn't do because of their lack of honor. Well, honor is the same way today. We saw earlier in our teachings that if we do not honor our father and mother, it can shorten our life. So here we have the same concept. Without honor, we don't receive from God. We don't, at least we don't receive all God has. Might receive something, but not fully what he has. And you don't just honor God, you honor the one that God sends you. That's why we have to pay attention to leadership and the ones we talk about leadership, but we didn't talk to specifically about spiritual leadership. We didn't go too deep into that. We'll get a little bit deeper into that. We talked a little about it, but we'll dig a little deeper. God wants us to see a little bit more there. So honor can help you receive what God has or what somebody is bringing from God to you. Or maybe not just what they're bringing from God to you. There are people who have the answers to your problems. There's somebody that has an answer. There's somebody who has a picture 
Go find the man with the pitcher. He'll show you the upper room. You remember that? I want to be the man with the pitcher. You know, <laughs> somebody that's got some answers. Not just somebody that always needs answers. Somebody that has some answers. There was a person with an upper room that they needed, and, and they gave it to them, you know? So saying those things to say that when we don't honor, we don't receive what God intended for us to receive. And so in this particular town where Jesus grew up, there was a culture, at least related to Jesus, but I say more than that, but at least to Jesus, it was a culture of dishonor. Everybody say culture of dishonor. Now, when you look at the word culture, often we think about culture as being refined, you know, a person who appreciates the finer things of life, maybe art or finer settings and trappings, finer food, um, experts at certain uh, fineries of life. They're more what we would say cultured, more refined. Now, that's one way that you look at culture, but the way we're looking at it today is not from that vantage point. We're talking about culture being the consensus attitude or the shared attitude of a group of people, the culture of a society. Now, it is related, however, to the people who are refined more because refinement does raise you above your culture. Custom or the practice of custom without thought is ignorance in action. So to go along without thought is not the wisest thing to do. You just think about that. So culture is shared attitudes by a group or shared values or shared goals or shared practices. Now culture will give you the ability to excuse wrong. Your tradition will justify your error. It can be wrong, but if you get enough people who believe it's right, then you'll do it anyway. That's why mob rule is never trustworthy. Because mob rule will take the group consensus and act on it without thought. Remember these old West, Western, we all, there's a lynch mob out here, you know, and uh, you can't, you can't follow a lynch mob. You got to have thought about what you're doing. Amen. So reaction is not necessarily proper action. And so culture is shared attitudes or shared values or shared goals or shared Practices or patterns of behavior or beliefs, social forms or social norms. That's what culture is. It's what's accepted. Now, I don't care whether you like Rocky Top or not. In this part of the world, you need to learn how to like it. <laughs> Why? It's a cultural norm. <laughs> you get what I'm talking about? See, it's just, part, it's just part of the fabric here. So we accept culturally even things that maybe in other settings we wouldn't, we wouldn't do or like. Now, I'm not saying you wouldn't like Rocky Top on your own, but uh, it wouldn't be my, on my playlist, I'll just say that. <laughs> but in certain settings, it's quite all right. You follow me? Because it's a part of the fabric of who we are. So social forms and social norms are part of what creates our culture. Traits of a group, group think. Amen. Now we have a lot of that in our society today. Now people develop their culture. I just jotted a few of these things down. Is it all right if I share with you? 
a little bit. People develop their culture or rules of practice based on, according to scripture even, it says by tradition, what's been passed down. We do what we've been taught to do. Right or wrong, we just do what we've been taught to do. We think the way we've been taught to think. So uh, people develop their culture by tradition or association. You get around to people that think a certain way, that association, it'll begin to become your way of thinking. That's why I say custom is one of the highest forms of ignorance. Because custom will be accepted without thought. You just embrace it. So people develop their culture by social approval. I just want to fit in. I just want to be a part of the group. So your moral decisions are based on, will it fit in? So you're quiet about your faith because that is not accepted in this environment. That's why they're trying to intimidate you out of your faith. The media, the news media, uh, Hollywood and all these, they want to intimidate you. Don't say anything about that. And certainly don't oppose our sin or we'll cancel you. So association becomes a part of developing our culture, our acceptance by others, how they fit in. You want to fit in. I'm talking about how culture gets established. And Jesus said these things make the word of God of none effect. You'd rather fit in than you would keep the truth. Turn that preacher down when you go through the drive-thru. Now, I'm not saying you're doing that because you need to hear. I'm saying that sometimes you do it because you're ashamed of that. I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ, and I'll talk openly about it. I don't care who likes it or who doesn't. You say, well, well, you don't have to jam it down somebody's throat. No, but I don't have to be intimidated by their pressures either. I am unapologetically a Christian, and I don't care who likes it or who doesn't. That's it. <laughs> no apologies given. Well, I don't like that. Well, I don't really care whether you do or whether you don't. It means absolutely nothing to me whether you like it. Well, you're trying to force your faith on me. No, you're just bothered by truth. Ain't nobody forcing nothing. Take it or leave it. But don't tell me I can't have it. You do what you want to with it. I'm talking about how cultures, environments get established. Jesus, in that certain environment, he couldn't do anything. It's an osmosis situation. You know, uh, Effortless or unconscious assimilation. It's just you pick it up. It's just, it's just in the air. It's just in the water. You get around it and it starts getting in you, getting on you and getting in you. That's osmosis. Nobody's necessarily blatant about it. It's just there. It's in the air. It's in the culture. Uh, we establish culture by training. We get taught. Now, in the military, of course, a lot of you, uh, a lot of you folks, some, some, several men, some women, you had uh, military training. Well, I can tell you, when you go in, now I don't think they do this as much as they used to, but back in the day I went in, your drill sergeant was not your friend, and he didn't want to be your friend, and he didn't want you to think about him as your friend. And they tell you right away, don't think of me in that way. Your mother's not with you. Your girlfriend's not here. You belong to me, boy. And they'll use the word boy with you too. Well, that's kind of offensive. He don't care at all. <laughs> Let me tell you what, the word boy is probably the nicest thing you're going to hear from him. <laughs> it's going to be sprinkled with a lot of other things. Creative words assembled together and I didn't even know that you could assemble them that way. 
I'd heard them all. I just didn't know they'd work together like that. <laughs> and they don't care whether you like it or whether you don't. And why do they do that? They do that to break you down. And they develop a culture where your response is instant to your commands. Because in the right setting, it really may genuinely save your life. You don't ask why. You just do it. In a combat zone, you don't ask why. You just do it. Trust me. That's all you do. You just act. You can figure it out later. But right now, you do what you're supposed to do. Amen? Amen. And so training you, it prepares a culture. Culture is also established by propaganda or persuasion. And these propaganda experts know this. Hitler had a propaganda minister, a minister of propaganda to change the hearts and that lie enough and people will believe it. Just say it long enough and say it in enough ways, people will begin to accept it and embrace it. And there was a culture of death on a whole nation. Those death camps were accepted by the people who knew about them the consensus population, not everybody, but the consensus population, they embraced it. The propaganda justified it. Because we're getting rid of these mean old Jews and others and Christians. So propaganda will prejudice a people against certain things. The word prejudice, we always use it mostly in the, war, in the, in the arena of race you know, person's prejudice against, you know, certain skin colors or certain ethnic groups or certain social, you know, elements, whether it be money or, you know, we, we get prejudice. Well, the word prejudice, all it means is to prejudge. Well, if you've traveled a lot overseas like I have, um, there's certain foods that it's real hard to do that. It's a what? I'm prejudiced. <laughs> I'm prejudging this food. I've never tasted it. But trust me, given options, I ain't never going to taste it. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? So to say, are you prejudiced? Well, it depends on what you're asking about. Of course, we're all prejudiced. We have things we prefer, so we prejudge. So it's not just in the air, you know, that's a, that's a small thing. When we get over in race or ethnicity or things of that nature, we, 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 we do have prejudices there, but it's, it's, it affects us all the time. And people try to turn you against things. They'll prejudice you against somebody that uh, maybe they don't want you to associate with. They'll create it. A whisperer separates chief friends. So they'll give you a prejudice or a bias against somebody to create in you a, a desire to not associate with them. So prejudice, you know, covers a lot of territory. So we think, well, I'm not prejudiced. Well, yeah, you are. But maybe on issues that are not so important. You follow what I'm talking about? But then it does limit us. You know, you won't try any new thing. You'll never, you know, kids... You, you ever had to play helicopter to get them to eat? <laughs> you know, here comes the you know, here comes the bite of this, and it's these green beans or something. It's like they'll they'll let you know whether they like it or not. It's coming back. <laughs> you get what I mean? So you're trying to persuade them. Maybe they will like it, but see, they're prejudiced against it. They're not eating that. They want something with a whole lot of sugar in it. They'll eat that. Amen. So uh, prejudice or bias can create a cultural problem. Politics. Now, when I say politics, I'm not talking about Democrat, Republican, or that. I'm talking about um, the, the, the body politic is kind of like the uh, diplomacy or the tactics of a movement. There's certain arenas you get in where people play politics to get ahead to get influence. I'm not talking about, again, 
Democrat or Republican or how you vote. I'm just talking about politics that goes on at your work. You follow me? I mean, it just happens. And people play, you know, they play that political thing. So it's a real deal. And it creates a culture. You've been around it, I suppose. And in customs, customs create lots of uh, cultural issues. Amen. Ellie Jones uh, wrote this. He said, culture is simply how one lives and is connected to history by habit. Now, I want to I read that again. Culture is simply how one lives and is connected to history by habit. Now, that's a good statement. It doesn't matter what the laws of the land are. Laws of the land will not hold up when a society has a different culture. You don't believe that? How do you think the drug laws get changed? The, the, the leaders will change the law to adapt to the culture. Because you can't continue to lock everybody up. Because it doesn't matter what the law says, they're not going to do it. So the culture begins to dictate the rules. It begins to tell you what the rules are going to be. Because people are just not going to. So persuasion begins to change the law. You can't govern a people who are non-governable. That's why our founding father said the Bible is the basis for a republic. Because if you don't have a moral people, it won't work. It just won't work. I'm talking about culture. Jesus could there do no mighty work. Culture wasn't conducive. So our culture should be created by truth. Should be. It should be created by love. What is true? What well, is the Bible? Where the Bible is not preached, cultures disintegrate. Where the gospel is not allowed, cultures, this is historical, cultures begin to disintegrate. They begin to fall apart. Where the gospel is not allowed to be preached freely. Because you take that truth out of the fabric of a people and they begin to act like heathens. Because they are. We're all heathens without Christ. Amen. We just begin to act out what we are. We do it. Amen. And so culture should be created by truth or love or respect. Mutual respect is, is absolutely essential in a good, godly culture or in a place where life is good. Uh, morality, it dictate, dictates the culture. What's your moral attitude? Well, I believe I'm a live and let live person. Really, that's nice. That sounds real sweet. That means you have no standards. <laughs> I'm not talking about telling everybody what to do. I'm talking about having convictions about how you're supposed to live. Well, if they don't bother me, just let it go on. Well, see, that's how society turns into what it turns into. I mean, that's exactly how it, how it becomes that. So family, what you think about family, you know, has got a whole lot to do with how a culture is set up. Or how a society is set up. I'm talking about developing a society of honor. The culture of a society. It has to be run by honor. Again, that honor starts with honoring God first. Well, you don't have any respect for anybody else if you don't honor God first. That's the basis of all of it. Well, I think these churches, they, they shouldn't get tax exemption. They, these churches, these, these preachers, they're just charlatans. You've got a bad attitude. You got an attitude issue. See, in that attitude issue, you say, well, it's the truth. It's not the whole truth. It may be individualized truth in certain settings, but it's not the whole truth. 
You just do that to alibi for your unbelief. To excuse your unwillingness to follow the gospel. But if you put that in a whole society, then, you know, any morality gets pushed out. Amen. So family values and things of that nature, they're critically important. And if they're not taught and trained into our people, then our culture begins to take a drift. A lot of what's being taught in schools now, folks, is shameless. It's absolutely beyond the pale. It's beyond the pale. Now, I'm not saying every teacher. I'm not saying that. Because, you know, you always, you know, you say things and you paint with a broad brush and everybody thinks you're talking about every individual. I'm not. But I'll say this, the system itself is not conducive to the truth of God. That's a fact. But, so our values and knowing right from wrong and all these things are, are things that create the culture. All of these come from God and His Word. That's how we get this basis for truth. Uh, where the Scriptures, again, are not allowed, society disintegrates. Our moral compass must come from God. So as a society, if we have a moral compass, it must emanate from the truth of the Word. Well, I believe other people have other moral codes, and I believe, well, that's okay, as long as it's really a moral code. But I don't think you find morality apart from God, and I don't think you find God without His Word. Now, you say, well, you're just a Christian, a, a, a Christian enthusiast. Yes. I don't mind telling you, I am a Christian unapologetically, and I do believe there's one way to God, and that is through His Son, Jesus Christ. I don't believe there's eight ways, ten ways, four ways, two ways. I believe there's one way, only one. Well, you're bigoted. No, I'm truthful. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's what I believe. Well, that makes you narrow-minded. No, it makes me truthful. Do you call it narrow? Narrows the way? <laughs> Broads the way? You ever go to a city? I mean, every city you go to, there's always a street there called Broadway. You ever notice that? The name of the street. I won't sing the song. But anyway, every city has a Broadway in it. Now, somebody knew what they were doing to do that. Do you ever go to a city and ever see a street named Narrow Way? <laughs> I've never seen one. I've never seen Narrow Way in any city. There might be, probably is, but I've just never seen one. And I can tell you what, if there is a Narrow Way, I promise you this, it's not a thoroughfare. Broadway is one of the big streets in every city. And there are evil people at some point in time who did that intentionally to mock the Bible. I guarantee it. Somebody did. Somebody knew what they were doing when they did it. So our moral compass must come from God. Our moral compass should not come from social clubs, political groups, groupthink, the media, or the need to conform or fit in. That's not where you get your social moral compass in the name of tolerance and acceptance we've allowed our value system to be taken from us well you need to be tolerant tolerant of what sin well you you can't tell every, everybody how to live their life well to be perfectly honest really with you really yes i can i can tell you exactly how to live your life that doesn't mean you'll listen, but isn't that what I do every single solitary week? So why would you think that's not my job? Well, I'm not going to do what you say. I don't care. <laughs> it's still my job. And next week, I'll do it again. Well, I don't like you. Well, guess what? I love you. 
<laughs> Amen. That is our job. Amen. A quote, culture itself is neither edu education or lawmaking. It is an atmosphere and a heritage. H.L. Minkin said that. Culture itself is neither education or lawmaking. It is an atmosphere and a heritage. Jesus, in his own hometown, was a dishonorable hometown. That wasn't necessarily in the law. It wasn't necessarily taught in schools. But it was the prevailing attitude. So it was the heritage of the community. So it doesn't matter what your laws say, it's what the people do and what the people think. And let me tell you something, just because you want to join a club does not mean the club is going to accept you. Well, we've got quotas. Oh, really? I could right now really drill down right there. Supreme Court just addressed this issue. It doesn't make any difference how much you say accept somebody if the people won't accept them. You cannot legislate that sort of thing. That has to come from God and God alone. It just does. So you can dictate it, but you can't make it happen. Hey, are you home? Yeah. Praise God. So our family values have been eroded. Our sexual integrity has been corrupted. Folks, this confusion that's in our society, gender confusion, I mean, there are people who think they're animals. They're identifying as animals. Well, you think I'm, I mean, you laugh about it, but it's in our public schools. I mean, you got to have a kid with a litter box. That used to be institutionalizing behavior. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a mental disorder. But it's really not. It's a spiritual disorder. Because of such confusion, that tells you how, how, how strong propaganda is, how we can get people to believe they're a cat. Identify as a cat. Well, meow, that's all I can tell you. <laughs> wolf, wolf. <laughs> I mean, it's pathetic. I mean, it's just pathetic. A human being created in the image and likeness of Almighty God is reduced now by propaganda to being a cat. How blasphemous. And we think, it's, well, it's okay. It's not okay, stupid. No name calling. But if you identify, just don't tell anybody. Outgrow that one. And so confusion has replaced wisdom. Feelings have replaced logic. I remember when I, you, I think it was college freshman class. I believe it was a freshman. It might have been a sophomore class. But I took a course on logic. I don't know anybody in here have a course on logic. Somewhere along the way, you probably took one. But I liked it so much, it was hard. It really was hard. You, you wouldn't think it is. But I liked it so much, I kept the textbook. I've got it in my, in my library at home right now. I've got the textbook. And I'll get it out sometimes and work my way through certain things. And it, it's fun, but it really challenges your, your thought process. Logical thought is a part of deductive reasoning. If, if one and one is two, then two and two is four. And it will be that the next time you come. That's a logical conclusion. 
But when you get into allegorical conclusions or you get into feelings-based math, then one and one is three and two and two is five. So you get into, because I think it is. I don't care what you think. It's not logical conclusions. Now, because logic has been taken out of the educational process, we have a whole bunch of people, even with Bible interpretation, who have feeling-based outcomes. And when you have feeling-based outcomes, you do not have logical thought. And so when you don't have logical thought, you come to wrong conclusions. If I think I'm right, then I must be right. But logically, that's not accurate. So since logic is not taught in mass, we have people who come to wrong outcomes. And in society, we've come to wrong outcomes. We just have come to wrong outcomes. If I feel like it's so, then it must be so. And so we protest to express our feelings when the outcomes are not logical. There's just no logical thought in it. You go back and study history, the things we're doing in this nation right now have led every society that's allowed it and permitted it, led them everyone to destruction. But we want to protest it and uh, get our way. You might not like the way you get. You might not like where it takes you. So evil is now good and good is now evil. And Jesus said that. They'll call good evil and evil good. Convictions have been replaced by choices. People don't have convictions anymore. They just have a choice. Well, you, you, you like that? Well, you do that. If it feels good, that's okay. It's a choice. Morals have given way to political correctness. Integrity has yielded to evilness, wickedness, and corruption. We legalize, legitimize sin with our legislation, thinking we are no longer accountable. If it's legal, we no longer have to give an account for it. You still will give an account for it, legal or illegal. Because God has a higher legal system than this one on this earth. And I don't care what, I don't care what legislation says. Wrong is still wrong. And right is still right. And that's a fact. And that's what we're living by. We legalize, legitimize sin by our legislation. We take God and Jesus and the Bible out of everything, thinking it will make our depravity or sin okay we take it out we don't have to hear it don't say that if you say that it'll make me feel bad well it's still the truth feel bad feel good doesn't make any difference it's still the truth you just don't want me to say it so you can say what you want to say we have no platform because you want it all Mm -hmm. we believe legislation overrides morality but it doesn't Now, I'm going to give you four things. I'm not going to do it quick because Nora took all our time. <laughs> That's what I'll tell her when we go home. <laughs> what? Don't pay any attention to her. Uh, four things. Uh, honorable society respects God and his word. Now, I'm talking about how we have an honorable society. First, you've got to respect God. And you've got to have respect our work, his word. Our enemies know to destroy um, America, they must destroy its moral compass. They have to. Which means they've got to destroy the families and they have to destroy the churches. Therefore, there's no point in getting married. Just live together. So if they can destroy that thought process, they're destroying the family. Well, we might not be married on paper, but we're married in our heart. You line outfit you. You'll leave the first chance you get. You just don't want a commitment. Alex de Tocqueville was a 19th century French, diplom French diplomat, political scientist, and historian who is best known for his two-volume work, Democracy in America, 
published in 1835 and 1840, in which he offered his observation on American politics, society, and culture gleaned from his travels across the U.S. in 1831 and 1832. The works of de Tocqueville are amazing. I've listened to them. I've listened, I've listened to all the works of de Tocqueville. It's tremendous in his observations. He said this. I'm going to read it. He said, I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her commodious harbors and her ample rivers, and it was not there. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her fertile fields and boundless forests, and it was not there. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her rich mines and her vast world commerce, and it was not there. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her public school system, in her institutions of learning, and it was not there. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her democratic Congress and her matchless constitution, and it was not there. Not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits flame with the righteousness did I understand the secret in her genius and her power. America is great because she is good, and if America ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. That's just it. See, he recognized that it's not in legislation. It's not in the court systems. It's not even in the Constitution. Those things are helpers. But it's the morality of a people. A Constitution will not work with a people who are too immoral to observe it. Or constantly try to change it for their own twisted, perverted, and self selfish goals. Not for the good of the people, but for the good of the individual. And that's what a lot of our legislation is about. To try to wrestle out of your pocket the things that make them wealthy and impoverish you through legislation. Now, I'm not, I'm not calling names. I'm just talking. That's just a fact. When a people or a society have lost honor, respect for God and His Word, everything else falls apart. Now, again, honor in our society is not an option. It's mandatory. Honor for God, country, one another, morality, church, law and order, Bible, and property are all a part of what we do. We find that the second thing in a society, again, you've got to have that moral code that guides you, but you've got to have a respect for life at every level if you're going to have a respectable society. Now, I could write down 104 of these, but I wrote down four because they're big ones. Just big ones. I'm talking about what creates the culture we live in. Amen? Now the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy 30, 19, I call heaven and earth to record again this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing or cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. So to choose life is the mandate for every society. When life is cheap, society deteriorates. When abortion can be just a thought without thinking what the ramifications of it are. This is a human being. This is a life. It's not just a thing. It's not just a blob. It's not just an inconvenience. It's not something that, well, it's going to mess up my future. Well, I wasn't prepared for this. Well, you were prepared, prepared for what got you there. Or maybe you weren't. <laughs> but what I'm getting at is life from cradle to grave is significant. Not just the abortion. That's the one that gets a lot of attention. And the Supreme Court just ruled on that. And some things were backed up that thankfully for. But since Roe v. Wade, they tell us, now not just nationally, they, I think the numbers in the United States were well known at 61 plus million babies that were executed before they were born. But they tell us globally it was well over 100 million. Now you can't take society that cheapens life at that level and it not affect other things. 
Life is cheap for everybody. So we euthanize our elderly. We euthanize our handicapped. It's exactly what Hitler did. Cheapen life where no life, if it's not productive to me, is important. If I can't get out of you something that I, I, I consider valuable, then we'll eliminate you. You're a burden. You're a needless eater. You listen to the Global Economic Forum, the World Economic Forum, of which many of your politicians adhere to, and they call you useless eaters. The green movement is absolutely neck deep in it. That's exactly right. They're, 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 they're perfecting food that'll kill you. You don't believe that. Don't get me on the or the aftermath of it. Thrust on you would not give you what they knew would stop it when a person contracted this stuff would not allow you to take it under penalty of, of the doctors going to jail. And they knew what would stop it. And then put something in your body that'll carry you till you die with infection. Well, I don't like to hear that. I know you don't. But you ought to be outraged at a bunch of political figures that would do that to you. How many millions globally have been killed through this? If you think these people are on your side, you're kidding yourself. If you think they're not evil, you are kidding yourself. And they're not done with you. They're already talking now about a triple. <laughs> I got to quit right there. I got to quit right there. So these things are, you know, they're big issues. Before I formed the end of belly, I knew you, Jeremiah 1 5, and uh, Psalms 139 13. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. So, children in the womb are covered by God. Amen. But also dishonoring our elderly. Leviticus 19 32. Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head. That's gray hair. Some of us have it, but well, you don't know it. I don't have much, really, just a little bit. Uh, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honoring the face of the old man and fear God, for I am the Lord. So the Bible says we honor the face of our elderly. We give honor to our elderly. Now you'll find in the Oriental culture where uh, Buddhism and some of those Eastern religions really are, they're into ancestral worship. Now, I'm not advocating that, but because they're into ancestral worship, the family unit is a lot more um, honored than sometimes we find here. It shouldn't be that way. You go in a, a, a business owner's shop and he'll have back on the wall. I've seen it so many times. There'll be a picture of one of the old patriarchs of the family and, and they're burning incense right there to in honor of the spirit of that man. This may have been dead for years, but they honor their elders. Now it's proper to honor your elders. Now I'm not talking about from, from their vantage point. I'm talking about from a Christian standpoint. It's proper to honor the elderly. So a culture that does not honor life, whether it be birth or death, is a, is a culture that, that's not friendly to the blessing from God. Amen. We find in Job 12 and 12, it says, wisdom is, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version, it says, wisdom is, the, is with the aged and understanding in length of days. Now, so the Bible says that when people live longer, they're, they're wiser. And you see children who do not respect the elders. That's not good. And parents need to teach their children to respect the elderly. Amen. Number three, an honorable society must have rules. Everybody say rules. rules. I remember at 13, not me being 13, but 
kids I've seen at 13, of which I will not name. But that seems to be the magic age when it's like, I don't want any rules. You ever had that wonderful experience? It doesn't happen magically at 13. It just seems to be give or take a little bit. But there's a time when children go into adulthood, they don't want any rules. They don't want what mom and dad tell them to do anymore. They want to find it out on their own. Well, sometimes, you know, there are 30 year olds that are still 13. They just don't want any rules. Rules are just restraints. But a society that has no rules is a lawless society. Matthew 24, 12, it says lawlessness is a last day sign. It says, and because lawlessness, lawlessness will be increased, the love of many shall grow cold. And so there are people that just don't want any rules. We just don't want to be lawless. We, we want to do it our way. I don't care if the light's red, just go fast. So you're living outside the boundaries. The Ten Commandments are your running space. You got plenty of running room in between, but there are boundaries. You step over, there's a cliff, there's a precipice. God gives you plenty of running room, but there are still boundaries to life. Life with limits. In a society with no limits, you saw it in the protest, you saw it in the burning downs of buildings, you saw certain cities right now virtually are shut down because of the lawlessness that has abounded in those once beautiful cities. And now shop owners have no shops to go home to, no go back to. Businesses are moving out in droves because there is no such thing as laws. And we have a campaign in this country to absolutely eradicate anything that would put anybody in jail for, for crimes. No bail in certain cities. You put them in, they get out automatically. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not here to advocate pro or no or pro, or no pro <laughs> for the criminal justice system. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a society where no rules exist. You can't have a society where no rules exist. I'm talking about a culture that's honorable. If you don't respect boundaries, you don't respect anybody's space. And if you don't respect their space, then you don't respect them. Don't walk on the grass, guys. If it ain't your grass. You say, well, that's just too confining. I'm just taking the shortcut. Well, it's not your shortcut to take. I'm talking about respect. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about respect and honor, and I'm talking about what lends to it. Now you say, well, that's preaching a little too close. I know it, but anyway, lawlessness is still a sin, and every society must have r rules and boundaries or it's out of control. Judges 17, 6, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's what a lawless society is. Are you home today? Praise God, I'm about done. Proverbs 16, 2. Everyone thinks they're right. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. And so everybody thinks they're right, so nobody wants to keep any rules. Amen. So rules are our moral restraint. Rules are not confining, but people... the. The scripture says that people will want to have no rules in the last days because of a lawless society in general. That's a sign of the times. Amen. So without restraint or discipline or rules, society becomes chaotic. Last one. Uh, I didn't finish that one, but I'll, I got to move on again. Nor took most of my time, so I got to hurry. Help me out here. Work with me, okay? Everybody look at Nora, look look at her right now, and say, can you believe her? Say it, do it. Y'all are not cooperating with me, I can tell you that right now. Okay. What? <laughs> An honorable society, number four, must have uh, a humility about it. 
we just went through June, which we could call a lack of humility month, couldn't we? We're going to be as nasty as we want to be, and we're going to stick it in your face, and we're going to make you like it whether you want to or or not. We're going to sin and be proud of it. Well, societies that are proud of their sin don't do very well. Well, I don't think it's a sin. Well, if it's not a sin, it's certainly an ugliness of people and their behavior. Now, it is a sin. But even if it weren't, it certainly is oppressively takeoverish over everybody else. And if you have some opposition, I'm, it's coming. You ready? Put finger in ears. If, if, according to them, if you don't like their stand, to hell with you. I told you it was coming, so don't get too mad at me. I know people get mad at me for all kinds of things that they do at home, but I, I, just, I but I'm just telling you. So honorable society must remain humble. A society full of pride is right for destruction. We take pride in our sinful ways. Proverbs 16:18. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So to have a society that God can bless, it has to be a humble society. We have to be a humble people. We have to humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God. We have to ask God to help us when we need help. I'll tell you right now, if all the Christians would get together right now and just pray for God to help the economy, he would. We're too busy trying to you know, figure it out instead of asking God to help us. If we'd ask God to help us with our society, he would. See, we have to humble ourselves before him. So any society that's going to be respectful and honorable has got to have a humility about it. Humility about their position. The way, guys, the way up in the kingdom of God is down. If a man wants to be the greatest, he has to be the servant of all. To be great in the kingdom of God, in the eyes of God, we have to be small. We have to be the servant. Jesus washed feet. Wow. The Son of God, the Creator, washed feet? The way up is down. I'm not too good to serve Him. I'm not too good to obey him. I'm not too good to listen to him. I'm not too good to do what he said. I'm just humble before him. And you know, humility is one of those things, the closer you think you get to it, the further you are from it. It's like a book I read the title of, I'm humble and proud of it. I started to use that for a title, and I thought, no, I better change that. That's not good doctrine, is it? (laughs) Anyway, or how to be humble just like me. (laughs) You don't think it'll work? Now, see, there's something about it. And you know, and that's the way humility is. The, 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 The reality of it is the more we think we have it, the farther we are from it. The closer we get to it, the farther we get from it. Because it's such an elusive thing, and we are so prone to pride. Self-exaltation, self-accomplishment, brag on self, promote self. But a society that's going to be humble before God is a society that God will bless. We're, you know, I mean, how long, how many times have you heard your whole life? Well, here we are, Americans. We live in the greatest nation that's ever been on the, on the earth in the history of planet earth. We're the greatest. There's a book written about that called The Ugly American. And when you go to other places, they're not real thrilled to hear that. 
from you. There are certain places that if you go to, you need to wear a Canadian maple leaf because it'll help you get through better. And your service in restaurants and maybe the food behind the scene might be a lot better for you if you quit being that ugly American. We're not the greatest. We're just people. And God loves people everywhere. And he loves them all the same. And he loves every one of them as much as he loves you. And when we understand that, maybe then we can do some good. I'm talking about societies that God blesses. We do live in a great country. At least it used to be. We're tr they're trying to kill it on every side. But these are real things, guys. Amen? Amen. So it takes humility to show honor. If I show honor, see, I have to exalt you as having accomplished something. And that may mean that you get more attention than I get. Wouldn't that be an amazing thing? But see, that's what honor is. Honor says, give honor to whom honors do. You give honor. That means you take the back seat, you show honor. I'm talking to you about honor. This is our theme. You got it? I said, you got it? So we have to, number one, respect God in His Word. Number two, we have to have uh, a love for life from cradle to grave. Number three, we have to have a proper uh, boundaries or rules. Number four, we have to walk humbly before God. Those are just four. I could have written down 24. But if I did that, we'd be here till next week. So I didn't do that. Let's all stand a minute. Just lift our hands up and worship God. Thank Him for His goodness. Lord, we love You today. Give You praise today for Your kindness. The love You show us. Lord, we want to be um, a contract people. We want to be people who can receive Your blessing. In that um, hometown of Nazareth, You couldn't do anything there, Lord, because... They were a dishonorable people. Help us not be that. Help us to be the humble people that we talk about. Help us to love the right things, to hate the wrong things, to not be a lawless people. So, Lord, we just lay ourselves before you today in that way. And, Lord Jesus, we summon you to make us that honorable people that only you can make us. Do in us what only you can do. Now, while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, let me ask you that all-important question today. Have you humbled yourself under the mighty hand of God? Have you given yourself to Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Do you realize beyond a shadow of a doubt that you cannot save yourself, that you need a Savior? It takes humility to recognize that. It takes a certain heart that says, I can't do it on my own. Lord, I need you. Now, I want you to bow your heads. I want you to respect the moment. If you're here today and you say, Lord, I don't, I don't know if I've done that. I don't know if I've given you my life. Or maybe you do know you haven't. Or maybe you've given your life and you've walked, you've given him your life and you've walked away from it. Maybe, maybe you're what we call a backslider. Maybe you're not living your life for him. You've not kept your commitment. If that fits you today, and you want prayer, I want you to lift your hand up right now here in the room. You say, I want today to be the day I change it. Okay, I see anyone else. You'd say, that's me. I want you to pray for me. I'm not going to call you to the front. I want, I want to pray for you right there where you're at. I promise you I won't trick you. I won't sneak up on you. If that's you today, anyone else, and you'd say, that's me. Pray for me, Pastor. Just lift your hand up right now so I can see it. And we can pray together. Now, if you're watching online, you've got a hand there in your heart. You're right there where you are. Maybe a number of people watch us at work. Maybe you're mobile. I know we've heard of people who drive for, for a living, and they watch us online. They've got ways of get, getting these things now. But all kinds of ways and all kinds of places. But wherever you are, Jesus sees you. God knows you. He's right there with you. Lift that hand in your heart and say yes to Jesus today. 
He knows who you are. Let's pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, I take you right now as my Lord and my Savior. I give my life to you to serve you today and forever. Sin, Satan, I don't serve you. Jesus, you are my Lord. You are my Savior. Sin, Satan, you're not my God. Jesus, you are my Lord. Now let's all just lift our hands and thank him that he hears us. Lord, we thank you that you hear us when we pray. We give you praise today for your goodness and your kindness. And we love you. Hallelujah. Now, I want to, now this is for people who raise their hand, but I want everybody to do it. I want you to turn to at least three people without any reservation whatsoever and just tell them boldly that Jesus Christ is your Lord. Would you do that? Hallelujah.